It's 1780, and the British have adopted a new strategy for winning the war. After the defeat at Saratoga, their overall commander, General Howe, is replaced by Quentin. Quentin decides that rather than continuing to battle the Patriots of the North, the British will focus their attention on the South and attempt to capitalize on the large population of loyal support in those colonies. The strategy is off to a strong start. In 1779, the British attack the city of Savannah, Georgia. There, they defeat a Franco-American allied force in one of the worst, deadliest battles. A few months later, in the spring of 1780, they lay siege to the city of Charleston, South Carolina. The Continentals hold out for around 60 days, but ultimately, they're forced to surrender. This marks one of the largest defeats for the Americans in the war thus far, as the British are able to capture an entire core of the Continental Army. Furthermore, the capture of the city gives the British a strong base of operations from which to conduct their future efforts in the South. The defeat has left the South without any American Continental forces remaining to defend it. All that remains now are bands of roaming militia who ambush and harass the British throughout the Carolinas, attempting to starve off total defeat. At this point, Washington is defending the American headquarters at West Point from his base in my hometown of Newburgh, New York. He's adopted the Fabian strategy and is now unwilling to move his army to engage the British directly. His three massive defeats in 1777 to 1778 have left his army badly weakened. He fears that if he moves, the British will be able to reclaim all of New York and with it, end the war. Instead of marching south, Washington instead stays encamped. He knows that his chances of defeating the British in a battle are slim, and all he has to do to win the war is simply not be defeated. So he adopts the intelligence strategy of essentially doing nothing. It's a strategy which has proved successful for people in his position throughout history, but it is one that the Congress and his men will have a hard time understanding. Washington believes that unless he can convince the French to lend direct military aid to his army, it would be foolhardy to seek out battle. Congress knows that it must take action or risk losing the South entirely. Congress demands that Continental Army be sent to the South and try and recapture it before it's too late. Washington recommends that one of his most trusted generals, Nathaniel Greene, be placed in charge of the Continental Army. However, at this point, Congress's faith in Washington's ability to lead is very low, and so they instead override his recommendation. They select Horatio Gates, the proclaimed hero of Saratoga, to take command of the army and head to the south. Gates takes his newly commissioned army and heads south towards Camden. He intends on constructing a series of defensive works about five miles north of the city to draw the British out of the city and into an unfavorable battle. Unbeknownst to him, the British are also on the march, and on August 15th, the two forces will accidentally collide during a nighttime march. Both sides retreat for the night, but in the morning, the two will enter battle. For both sides, the fate of the war may be at stake, and victory is a must. This is Grim Battaglia, and you're watching my documentary on battles of the American Revolution. This is the Southern Campaign, Part 2, the Southern Resistance and the Battle of Camden. After the fall of Charleston, what remained of the Continental militia forces retreated to North Carolina to await reinforcements via General Gates. However, some would stay and attempt to fight the occupying force in a guerrilla style, style campaign. The governor of South Carolina began rallying militia forces in the state's western frontier. The British sent General Charleston to take his cavalry along with the American Legion to pursue and quell the resistance brewing in the state's backside. He engaged the Americans in the Battle of Waxhaws. What followed would be a major turning point in the South Carolina campaign. Tarleston, with only 150 men at his disposal, was able to easily defeat the group of around 420 militiamen. The Continentals attempted to surrender by raising a white flag and laying down their arms, but their surrender was refused. The British came to a bloodlust and massacred many of the surrendered American militiamen. Hundreds would die in the ensuing carnage. The event sparked outrage across the people of the Carolinas, many of whom would have otherwise stayed neutral, now flocked to the Patriots' cause. Cries of Tarleton's Quarter and Remember War Sox became the rallying cry for the Southern Militia forces. Meanwhile, the Americans, still resisting the British control, were out for revenge. At the Battle of Blackstock Farm, an American militia group of around 250 men ambushed a British force. Catching them completely off guard, the Americans slowly and methodically set their guns upon a line of fences and took precise aim. 
Opening the battle with a devastating volley, they attacked from three sides, killing the British commander and refusing to give quarter to any British who would attempt to surrender. Gates arrives in North Carolina in August of 1780. Awaiting him are a group of thousands of undisciplined militiamen, many of whom have no battle experience or disoriented remnants of the forces that retreated from South Carolina several months ago. Gates determines that his force should march down the direct road to Camden and seize the city, which he has heard is underdefended. Almost every officer in his corps tries to persuade him to wait for reinforcements or to take a different path. The direct road leads through a swampy marshland that is filled with loyalists. It would be difficult or impossible to gather supplies, reinforcements, or intelligence during the march. Gates, however, disregards these reports. If he's victorious in retaking South Carolina, there's a good chance he'll be promoted to replace Washington as leader of the Continental Army. At 10 p.m., he instructs his men to move out and march towards Camden with all haste. The march is immediately off to a rocky start. The soldiers' afternoon meal was underprepared, and hundreds were falling sick to diarrhea and other bowel-related illnesses. The militiamen don't know how to march in formation, and there's confusion as people are lost in the woods or swamps. At 2 a.m., the Americans wander, unaware into an advanced party of Charleston's cavalry. There's a brief skirmish, but luckily for Gates, the British were just as surprised to see the Americans as the Americans were to see them, and they quickly pull back. Torsten retreated towards Cornwallis and told him they had discovered the main American army. Cornwallis had already received intelligence from loyalist spies that Gates was moving towards Camden, and he was already on his way to reinforce the city. In the morning, Gates learned that the British forces at Camden were nearly two times larger than what he'd expected. Furthermore, he conducts a headcount of his own men for the first time. He learns that he has almost a thousand less militiamen than he'd previously thought. He now has two options. He can retreat and wait for reinforcements, or he can push forward and engage the main British army. Gates decides to pursue personal glory and goes with the latter. From the start, Gates has made a crucial mistake. He's leading from too far in the rear and doesn't have a clear view of the battle. He's observing through his spyglass. And he's mistakenly believes that his militiamen are facing off against the weaker part of the British army. However, they are in fact fighting the stronger part of the British army. He observes a bunch of the British on the right moving around and milling about, and he believes that they're not yet ready for combat. Seeking to take advantage of this, he's going to order his militia to begin the attack with a charge. However, this will be a mistake. The British on the right are not milling around and getting into formation. They are, in fact, already in formation, and they themselves are preparing to launch an attack on the militia. So now, the militia are going to charge in to the stronger part of the British army, who are already in formation and prepared to give battle. On August 16th, 1780, Gates initiates the battle. He sends forward his militiamen on the American right to advance on the British forces. Gate, or Wallace, mirrors Gates' move and orders his combined forces forward to launch an attack on the American left. Fierce fighting ensues, but the American Continental forces are able to hold their ground and repulse the first wave of attack. On the right, the experienced British infantry react to the militia's advance by launching a charge of their own. Many of the Virginia militia have never faced battle before, let alone a bayonet charge. They flee so quickly that they take no casualties and suffer only three wounds. Seeing the Virginia militia routing, the rest of the militia quickly succumb to panic and begin to flee the battlefield. The governor of Virginia describes the incident to Congress. He wrote, picture it as bad as you possibly can, it will not be as bad as it really was. An officer from the South Carolina militia would later state, there was no effort really, no effort to rally, no encouragement to fight. Officers and men joined in the flight. I threw down my gun and fled the battlefield. It was clear that Gates had underestimated not only his opponent, but the strength of his own army. There was a reason that George Washington always kept his militia forces in the rear. In fact, Washington was known for holding the militia in extremely poor regard. He would comment on how the militia were always the first to come forward demanding battle, but they were also always the first to flee to the safety of their home at the first sign of danger. Washington firmly regarded the militia as more of a liability than an asset, and was often disgruntled that he was forced to deal with them. On the British left, the British combined forces regather and attempt to launch a second attack on the American position. 
Again, the now well-trained and battle-hardened Continental Army is able to hold their own against the British forces, and they push them back. Rather than letting the thrill of the battle take over, pursuing the fleeing militiamen, Cornwallis's men on the right decide to turn in a large wheeling movement and attempt to take the Continental forces in the flank. Gates quickly orders a group of North Carolina militia from the reserve to move forward and meet the advance. It's a gamble, but it pays off. The Carolina militia become the only militia force that day to hold their ground against the British. Outnumbered, they engage the British lines and attempt to prevent the Americans from being outflanked and defeated. Seeing that their militia regiments are faltering, Gates decides he must take decisive action. He orders a counterattack, and the American left advances on the British position. At first, they achieve success, and the British begin to lose ground to the weight of the American advance. However, the British are able to maintain order and force the Americans back. The retreat was sloppy and mostly unorganized. Attempting to take advantage of this, the British launch a counterattack of their own. General Gates takes action to maintain the lines. He rides forwards and begins to yell out encouragement to his men, and he's able to get them to reform the standard battle formation, holding the battle together. Seeing that the South Carolina militia are badly outnumbered and struggling to hold the flank, Gates orders a reserve force of Continentals to move forward and reinforce them. Cornwallis, seeing that the opportunity to seize an absolute victory is upon him, sends forward General Tarleston and his elite cavalry force. They've been ordered to bypass the embattled lines and launch a cavalry charge directly on the American flank, which would have devastating results if it was to connect. Seeing the cavalry coming, the reinforcements sent to be aid the beleaguered South Carolina militia lose morale. They are still several hundred yards away from the battle lines when they break and flee the battle. Torsten's cavalry, now unopposed, charges into the rear of the militia, breaking them almost instantaneously. He continues forward and smashes the rear of the Continental forces. Seeing that the battle is now hopeless, Gates mounts a swift horse and races away from the battle, traveling a full 60 miles to the safety of Charlotte, South Carolina. The rest of the American forces are not so lucky. They attempt to flee, but they're pursued and hunted down by the British. Only a small amount of troops are able to safely escape, heading into the swamps where the British cavalry won't be able to pursue them. At a time when the Americans desperately needed a victory to hold the war together, Gates had marched his army south and suffered one of the most stunning and devastating defeats of the revolution. With over 2,000 casualties, there would not be another deadlier battle for the Americans until the Civil War in 1860. Gates lost 900 men killed, 1,000 wounded, and 290 captured. Additionally, he lost eight cannons and over 200 wagons filled with supplies. Meanwhile, Cornwallis' army had only lost 68 men and suffered 245 casualties. A British officer would remember the day. He'd write how the road for some miles was strewn with the wounded and killed who had been overtaken by the Legion in their pursuit. The number of dead horses, broken wagons, and baggage scattered on the road formed a perfect scene of horror and confusion. Arms, knapsacks, and accoutrements found were innumerable. Such was the terror and dismay of the Americans. The victory for the British was absolute. Gates was disgraced and humiliated, not only for losing, but for fleeing so far from the battle so quickly. He was dismissed from his command, and only his political connections at Congress prevented an investigation and a court-martialing. Meanwhile, the militia they had routed ran so far that they pretty much abandoned the war effort. Most of them would simply return to their homes rather than resume fighting after the defeat that they had suffered. With that, the British had established control over South Carolina, and they were poised to continue their campaign north and continue the Southern strategy. Though badly defeated, the Americans were not out of the war. Congress decided to put Washington's original choice, General Nathaniel Greene, in command of a newly raised Continental Army that would be sent south to once more give battle to the British. Now, the fate of the entire war rests on General Greene's soldiers. If he's defeated by the British again, the Americans will be unable to raise another army, and the war and the South will be lost. This was Grim Badalia, and this is my documentary 
on the Battle of Camden and the Southern Resistance. Come back next week as we follow General Green and see if he's able to have more success than Gates in recapturing the South. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, or subscribe. And as always, I hope you enjoyed the video, and please, never stop learning.